right now. Awesome. Thank you. There we go. All right. My name is Adam Fletcher Sassy, and today it's my privilege to be here to talk with you about Omaha Black history. Uh, first, uh, let me give a little bit by way of background uh, so you know and understand. I grew up at 24th and 4th. Uh, which today is seen as kind of the center of North Omaha, or, or one of the centers of North Omaha um, in the 1980s and 90s. And I graduated from North High School in 93. Uh, I moved away from the city. Uh, in about 1998, I left Nebraska and came out here to Washington State. I got to D.C. and New York City and Taos in the middle of all of that. But uh, here from Olympia, Washington, I have spent the last 15 years uh, researching the history of Omaha, researching the history of North Omaha specifically, and then really diving into the depths of Omaha's African-American history in a very global sense. Uh, as I go along today, I'm going to explain some of what I found. I'm going to give you about the first 75 years of the city's Black history, because honestly, there is a lot here. I'm going to pack in way too much content in way too little time, and as I go along, I really want to encourage you to drop your questions into the chat. Like Cameron said, there's also a link to make a donation to the Great Plains Black History Museum. My work today isn't from the perspective of some kind of uh, beneficent white person who's trying to do right and be woke and all of the things. Instead, I am here in a sense of honor and obligation to the people who raised me. Uh, my mentors, when I was growing up, I'm trying to give back in a way that um, few people actually have. There is not one comprehensive source for all of Omaha's Black history. And even with the publishing of this, the very first ever book about Omaha Black history, there still isn't a single source because a lot of this history is unmined, it's unsearched, and it's unfound, as it were. It's waiting to be born and emerged again. So, I challenge anybody who's on this call today, who's listening to this presentation, to take it upon themselves and learn more, especially if you are from the community, especially if you have connections to the community. We need to raise this history up, not just for the sake of African-Americans in Omaha, even though it is their history, it's the whole city needs to learn this, especially white people. Um, we need to understand that this is about more than just us. This being history, this being purpose, power, potential and possibilities, this being the future of the city of Omaha. So from that perspective, I wanna share with you some of the history of African-American people, places and events from the history of Omaha, Nebraska. Also, in case you're interested, the book is available on Amazon. You just search uh, hashtag Omaha Black History. If you are uh, on social media, you can also use that hashtag to find a lot more. I've been posting for about 10 years on this topic. So you can find all of that research waiting for you. I will say really quick for the book, this information hasn't been published anywhere else. Check. So going back to this point, Omaha history includes African-American history. It also includes American Indian history. It also includes Asian American history. It also includes the history of all people of color who have ever come to the city, lived in the city and had an impact in the city. Um, it's really, really important that we recognize that despite all of the history books, literally, they're written about rich white men. It's kind of the jam in Omaha, but uh, we're expanding that. You know, we're really trying to grow this out. So this is the point right here. Before 1849, before the city of Omaha itself was formally founded, of course, there were American Indian tribes who were right there in the Omaha area. Imagine being down by the Missouri River. I don't know if you've been to the Lewis and Clark Landing or up to Dodge Park, but stand by the river and understand there were Black people with those American Indian tribes in the 1840s. There were reports of African Americans living among the Oto, living among the Ponca, and they were probably the first Black people in the Omaha area. New France, when France had owned, owned the whole Western part of the United States, and that region, there were black people reported to be living in the area. There were also trappers coming through and different folks I'm gonna mention in a minute. New Spain, they sent the Villa Sur expedition to the Nebraska area in 1720. And there were blacks with those, with that expedition. When the Louisiana purchase happened and the United States acquired 
the area, the region, including Omaha, uh, they sent the Lewis and Clark expedition up the Missouri River. Lewis and Clark, uh, Clark owned a slave who's, who was called York. Uh, York was born in 1770 and lived until 1832. The stories of his life are shaky. This is an image of him. It's a projected image because we don't actually have any paintings or anything, but all the same, this is an image of York who Omaha doesn't acknowledge. To their credit, St. Louis has a statue up in recognition of York as being the first African-American there. Omaha needs one, needs some kind of acknowledgement of this powerful figure who really was the first recorded instance of an African-American person in the Omaha area. In 1808, there was a Spanish fur tra trapper and trader whose name was Manuel Lisa, who built a fort at the base of Hummel Park. If you've ever been up there, up Ponca Road and um, John J. Pershing Drive by Dodge Park, there's Hummel Park. Hummel Park has a place called the Devil Slide. And if you ever get up there at the base of the slide, um, there was a fort. And that fort was called Fort Lisa. That's where Manuel Lisa traded furs from. He traded furs to all the tribes in the region. We're talking a dozen different tribes. And one of the trappers who came into his fort regularly and lived there for a period of time was named Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable eventually went on to found his own fort. And around that fort grew a city and that city was called Chicago. That's right. Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable is the founder of Chicago as we know it today. He lived in the Omaha area first. Fort Atkinson, just north of Omaha in Washington County up by Fort Calhoun. It's same, same. Fort Calhoun equals Fort Atkinson. Fort Atkinson, there were enslaved people who lived there as servants to the white officers at the fort. And we're talking at least a dozen, if not more, from 1819, or I'm sorry, from 1819 to 1827. Cabinier's post was a was also called the French Company, and it was another fur trapping post. This one was over in Dodge Park, right on the Missouri River, uh, right off of J.J. Pershing Drive. And Cabinier was a was a uh, Quebecois trapper. He came he one of the French Canadian trappers, and he came and opened up this po this post right at Ponca Creek and the Missouri River. And there were enslaved people and black trappers who came through that post between 1822 and 1840. In 1849, you all love the football team. You watch them play out of San Francisco. What? They're named that because they were gold diggers, literally. Like they were miners who were traveling from the East Coast to the West Coast to go gold mining. On their way, they came through the Omaha area. Some of the first burials recorded in Omaha, they're like not really popularly acknowledged, but all the same were 49ers who were buried up at Prospect Hill Cemetery at 33rd and Parker. Some of those 49ers were black people. So the fact of the matter is that African-Americans had presence in Omaha before Omaha was a city. And one of the reasons why I really want to emphasize this is because when people tell this history of Omaha of any kind, they don't tell this part. They don't tell this longevity for some reason, it offends a lot of people's sensibility, white people's sensibility to the history of Omaha because they think that it's so white. They think that it's so European. They think that it looks like me when instead in reality, it looked a lot like this image of York standing strong and mighty with this proud pose, with this muscular body, with this gigantic deer wrapped around his shoulders and a long gun. That's who the pioneer Nebraskans were. Oh yeah, and then Tom Brown. Tom Brown came back to Omaha. He moved back to Omaha in, 1897, in the 1890s. And when he moved back to Omaha, he was an old man. I mean, you can imagine that. He was born in 1812. He first came to Omaha in the 1840s as an enslaved person belonging to a trapper, trader, and hunter who was in the region doing his thing, doing the hunting. And Tom Brown worked the region. When he came back in the 1890s as an old man, he was like, oh yeah, I've been here lots. We used to come here all the time and I practically lived here. So also worth mentioning, also neglected by most Omaha history that's ever been written. So you might be wondering, Adam, where did you find all this crazy amount of information? And the fact of the matter is it's bizarre. Um, 
I have a lot of my fingers in a lot of different places. I have a library of about 60 books about Omaha history. But again, out of the 60 books related to Omaha history, um, I would say fairly three quarters of them do not mention African Americans specifically. Out of the other one quarter left, so 15 books that do mention African Americans in relationship to Omaha history, it's one mention or it's one sliver or it's the most popular names you've ever heard associated with Omaha. The rest of that quarter, those 15 books, um, are autobiographies written by African Americans about their history, their own history in Omaha. And they include slices of the city's history. For instance, Preston Love Sr., a great jazz musician who wrote from the 1950s onward all about Omaha's history, especially Black history in Omaha. Preston Love Sr. wrote his autobiography, and it's a beautiful book, A Thousand Honey Creeks, it's called. It's on Amazon. It, you can find a link to it on NorthOmahaHistory.com, my website. And A Thousand Honey Creeks talks about the history of Omaha and the history of African Americans in Omaha, but it's just a sliver of the book. In other autobiographies, they're generally by entertainers and sports stars, musicians and writers and poets and different folks and sports stars. And they really emphasize African Americans as entertainers to Omaha's history not as politicians, not as powerful business people, not as huge crime lords, not as anything other than entertainers to white people. I'm here to tell you that African-Americans have a very deep history in the city's history, let's keep going, that goes far beyond anything written in Omaha's history book so far. Before 1849, the other mention that I want to make is of Winter Quarters. You might be familiar with Winter Quarters. It's a popular place. You can go up to Florence today and go to the Winter Quarters Interpretive Center run by the Mormons or by the Church of Latter-day Saints, and you can really get the sense. It's important to mention that among that group of folks who came through in 1846, they set up this image, which you see right here was the, one of the original townships created. It was laid out in city blocks. It was very orderly. They were cabins, houses, and Saudis made. And uh, uh, there were African Americans among those folks. They weren't counted as members of the church because the church prohibited it. Uh, th however, they weren't enslaved people. Instead, they were traveling as free people. So I have their names right here for your reference. In, from 1850 to 1859, a lot of important things happened in Omaha's history. First thing, the city was founded. 1854. There's this romantic tale of a group of Iowans coming across the river from Council Bluffs, and they sit on the hillside and have a picnic with their wives and children, because of course it was all men who founded the city. But they're sitting on this hillside and they, on July 4th, 1854, and they declare, we're going to have a city here. Now that's really romanticized in reality. Omaha was a real estate scheme, as were most riverside towns in Nebraska. They were founded all up and down the Missouri River, in 1854, when the area was opened for uh, white domination, for white settlement to happen, uh, they had there were treaties written with the tribes, and the federal government opened the gates and said, "Okay, white people can move in." And when that happened, Omaha was settled, but so were more than a hundred other towns along the Missouri River. Omaha was one that worked because there were powerful economic backers from Council Bluffs, from Ohio, from New York State, who were pouring money in to make sure that the territory took off because they were gonna make a lot of money in real estate, and it worked. Immediately upon the settlement of the, um, immediately upon the settlement of the territory, um, there were racist laws established. There were a variety of racist laws established just right away. You will hear tales about how Nebraska and Kansas, and we had to separate the two, and slavery being available in, in Kansas and not available in Nebraska and all these kinds of things. But the reality is that the territory had racist laws from the beginning. One of them initially set uh, was that the new Omaha Public School District that was created uh, was established with this whole idea that Black people would not be educated within that system. It just wasn't going to happen. That uh, Jim, those Jim Crow rules took place from 1859 to 1867. You can read about them in detail in my book. 
The other thing is that slavery was legal in Nebraska from 1854 until 1865, the end of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. Those are really important hallmarks during that time. However, like I said, when white folks get all caught up in African-American history, generally, we focus on these negative elements. One of the things that I'm really seeking to do in my book and with my work, my advocacy, oh, let me tell you all this too. I'm a volunteer. I am here today as a volunteer. Nobody's paying me to do this. Nobody paid me to write the book. Nobody pays me to publish an article a week on my website, at least. Nobody pays me to do social media. I'm just doing this out of passion. This is really, truly a passion project. So part of the passion project is telling the whole history instead of just the convenient parts. The whole history, 1860, black people made up approximately 3% of Omaha's population. The city was about 1,883 people recorded in this federal census. Approximately 60 of them were African-Americans. They were identified as black. You'll notice this photograph right here. This photograph is actually from the 1860s and it shows two black children in the middle of Farnham Street in downtown Omaha as we know it today. This is right about 12th and Farnham. These children would have been among that 60, except that they weren't counted by the census. Children weren't counted by the census at that point. Black businesses started to open in Omaha as early as 1860. Let me repeat that so that you can hear it. Black businesses started to open in Omaha in 1860. Guys, 150 years ago, there were black businesses in Omaha. Did you know that? Did you understand that African-Americans have this economic base that they have struggled to create for this amount of time? And frankly, what can we learn as white people from that is an important question I constantly ask myself. That said, that story is not told very often. I covered in depth in my book. Political action began in the 1860s. There, were, there was political party organizing. At this point, the Republican Party, remember the Republican Party was the party of Abraham Lincoln, and the Republican Party was the party of black voters, or at least it was presumed to be. We'll hear the story of something different in a minute. But some of that party organizing among African Americans in Omaha began in the 1860s. There were voting attempts, including an attempt uh, that was focused on um, actually getting into the booth. and. Uh, facing, you know, the, the black voters in the 1860s faced resistance in Omaha, and people didn't want them to vote. Um, there was a black pioneer named Cyrus Bell. He lived from 1848 to 1925. And he said, uh, reflecting on voting in the 1860s, Bell said, very naturally, every Negro was expected to vote the Republican ticket if allowed to vote at all. And hence, it was a reasonable expectation that every Democrat would do his best to prevent Negroes from voting. And that was the tone of voting for African-Americans in Omaha in the 1860s. Another incident in Omaha uh, and, and continual incidences happened when enslaved people were escaping. Uh, there's a story of Eliza in 1860. She got away from, quote, got away from, she escaped her kidnappers. She escaped her enslaver uh, and she went off to Chicago. Her enslaver was a man named Nichols, who eventually became a Nebraska state senator to the U.S. Congress. She escaped him. She got to Chicago. And the story of what happened to her from there gets a little bit hazy. She either escaped then or she was forced back to Nebraska. We don't know the actual end of that story, as is the case with a lot of African-American folks in early Omaha history. Slavery ended formally in 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation. However, racism in Omaha was just getting started. 1865, an anti-miscegenation law was passed by the Nebraska Territorial Legislature that said basically uh, black people and white people could not get married legally in Nebraska. That law was reiterated in Nebraska more than three times between 1865 and the 1920s. It went on and on. Uh, also in the 1860s was the establishment of African-American uh, economy in the form of steady regular jobs. A lot of uh, blacks had worked as domestic servants for white people and had worked in uh, different kind of part-time and non-permanent jobs, let's call them in our current vernacular, um, for very low wages. Porter, uh, the Pullman Porter Company was established in 1865 with the launch of the Union Pacific Railroad. 
And Mr. Pullman himself decided that he was going to hire folks out of Union Pacific's base in Omaha, Nebraska to work on those cars. Early on, he hired white people, white men and black men to serve in the cars. However, Mr. Porter decided early on that African-Americans were the people that he wanted to be those porters. From then on, they were called Pullman Porters. And those porters eventually lived in one community north of Dodge, south of Cumming Street. So if you're tracking the geography of the city, understand that Porter Town itself was located south of Cumming and north of Dodge. We don't think of that as North Omaha today. We think of that as kind of the squishy near North Omaha or um, maybe North downtown. In reality, it was a very vibrant community of African Americans and of Eastern European as well as Scandinavian immigrants. But that's for another day's presentation. 1870. The tone inside of Nebraska's African American population is changing dramatically. In this decade between 1870 and 1879, the first black political candidates emerged for office in Nebraska. Richard Curry ran for an Omaha City Alderman's position, the equivalent of the Omaha City Council today. Uh, he was born in 1843. He was an enslaved man uh, who gained his freedom after the war with the Emancipation Proclamation, and he died in 1883. But in 1870, he ran for alderman. Didn't win, but he ran. And that's the first recorded incident of an African-American running for political office in Omaha and in Nebraska in general. The first recorded civil rights activism happened in the 18, 1872. Uh, Omaha ran a formal colored school uh, from 1869 to 1872. Before 1869, I mentioned that earlier, before 1869, Omaha schools did not educate African-American youth. They just refused to. And there was no formal education for those black students so far as we know. But in 1869, they decided that they were going to educate them and they opened a quote, colored school in downtown Omaha. Again, you can learn more details about this in my book, but the long story short is that the man pictured here, Edwin Overall, he was the first, as far as I can find in my research, the first African-American civil rights activist in Omaha. And in 1872, he led a group of parents to the Omaha School District Board and he demanded the end of the quote colored school and the integration of black students into local schools. It worked. The district shut down that school and integrated black students. Does that mean that they were welcome in the schools where they ended up? Who's to say? I can't find evidence so far in my research demonstrating one way or the other. However, at this point, the black students at Omaha were congregated again, north of Dodge, east of 20th Street, going all the way down to 4th Street. You can't even imagine 4th Street in downtown Omaha anymore. It's like, what does that mean? It was down by the river. There were folks living down by the river, approximately where the interstate bridge comes across in downtown Omaha. There were houses down there. There were actual neighborhoods down there. And one of them was a Black neighborhood. Black students went to Cass Street School. They went to the North School, later called Izzard School. Anyhow, the long story short is they were integrated in 1872. Oh, 1871, the Chief Justice of the Nebraska uh, State Supreme Court declared that uh, black jurors shouldn't be able to exist. They should not be on juries because he regarded them as being less than human. Again, in Nebraska in 1871, the, that there was a court case that went all the way through the Supreme Court. And despite his objection, the Nebraska State Supreme Court overturned that opinion in 1873 and blacks were allowed to serve on uh, juries across the state. Also in the 1870s, there was an emergence of black culture in Omaha for the first time. A man called Professor George T. McPherson arrived in the city. McPherson was a pianist genius. I mean, he was a spectacular player. You can read his biography in the book, but the long story short is highly trained, highly educated, greatly gifted, the first ever African-American piano teacher, the predominant piano teacher for more than a decade in the city, 1870s. We're not taught that in Omaha public schools. I never got it from the time that I was in fourth grade onwards. We're not taught that in our community centers. We're not taught that in our history books. Here you go. Omaha's greatest pianist of the 1870s was an African-American teacher. That blows some white people's minds. It doesn't blow other, uh, other people's minds. It doesn't blow African-Americans' minds because of course, black excellence has been in Omaha since the beginning. We're just now learning to acknowledge it. <laughs> 
In the 1880s, black excellence blew up. All these folks pictured here, many of them are uh, from that era of um, uh, that, that, that 1880s era when uh, the growth, the richness of the community really began to took, take root. Just so everybody knows, I am going to answer a lot of these questions uh, that are coming into the chat. I'm going to answer them at about 15 till. I'll start going into those. So I've got a few more minutes that we'll be rocking and rolling on the presentation. So Pete, keep putting your questions into the chat is a long story short. I'll get to them, I promise. Uh, in 1882, the first ever convention for African-Americans in Nebraska was held in Omaha. This convention had more than 200 people at it from all across the state. Nebraska was open to homesteading. And in that homesteading, a lot of African-American settlers came as farmers to Nebraska. Now, they have their own history. And it's covered awesomely by uh, one of the people who sh whose work I stand on. Her name was Bertha Calloway. And Bertha Calloway's story actually begins in the 1950s in Omaha. But the long story short is Bertha wrote a spectacular book about African Americans in the Great Plains that covers that history of uh, black folks across the state as farmers, ranchers, cowboys, and et cetera. The long story short though, is that they came to this convention in Omaha in 1882. This was the emergence of a formal black political entity and the real stamp of African Americans on the state's political body to say, we exist, we matter, we have a voice, and we are here. When they did that, uh, it shook Nebraska's uh, roots. Because with the state settled on white supremacy, it really rattled a lot of folks. Cecilia Wilson Jewell was born in 1882, in that decade. 1882. Cecilia went on to become a classically trained singer who traveled Europe and was a very important figure musically in Omaha for a long time. But she came back and married a man named Jimmy Jewell. And we're gonna talk about their work together in just a little while, a couple decades on. But remember that she was born back here in the 1880s. The black professional class emerged in the 1880s. These were folks who were doctors, lawyers, dentists, and had other professional jobs throughout the city, but mostly concentrated in the African-American community, serving black people because Omaha was segregated. That's the understatement of the day. But the long story short is that housing, schools, uh, medical service, legal services, all of this was segregated. I'm gonna get into this more as the decades go on, but know that the black professional class began emerging in the 1880s. The first Nebraska civil rights law was passed in 1884. See, you had all kinds of national trends that were affecting Nebraska. So it became a state in 1867, after the end of the Civil War in 1865. It wasn't instantaneous. It took a couple of years for Nebraska to come right and to settle all, this, all of the white supremacy that was built into its laws that statehood demanded they remove, including the ability of blacks to vote in the state. When all of that was settled, when the state became, or when the territory became a state, um, Nebraska was in the middle of this era nationally where African-Americans were thriving across the entire country. This really took root in the late 1860s and went all the way into the 1870s when African-Americans gained political power, economic power, social power across the entire country. And Nebraska was part of that movement. So in the 1880s, a law was tried to be, in 1883, they tried to pass a law through the federal government securing civil rights for blacks uh, on a national level, on a federal level. It didn't work. So the next year, there was a movement by state legislatures to impose civil rights laws on their states. Nebraska was one of the states that adopted a law in the 1880s, in 1884, for civil rights for African-Americans. However, it was mostly a shiny tokenistic law that didn't really get enforced. It didn't enforce the ability of African-Americans to vote freely. It didn't enforce the ability of African-Americans to run for political office. And it didn't enforce real fines and punishment for white people who acted in racist and other white supremacist ways. What it did do was begin this foothold. The other thing that happened, a couple other really important things happened in the 1880s, including the launch of the first black newspaper in Omaha. It was called the Omaha Progress and it ran from 1889 to 1906 had two different owners during that time, and it was the first black newspaper. Now, we think of newspapers as quaint. I don't know the last time that I picked up a paper copy of a newspaper. 
I flip through my news every single day, though, and I, I stay informed, uh, including on Omaha News. But uh, back then, the newspaper was the only form of the news. There, there was, of course, no Google News. There was no news feed into your uh, inbox or anything like that. And the newspaper was literally the only way to get it. So Blacks didn't see themselves in the Omaha newspapers. They didn't see themselves in a newspaper called The Republican. They didn't see themselves in a newspaper called The Omaha Herald or a newspaper called The Omaha World or its combined factor called The Omaha World Herald. It didn't see, the African-Americans didn't see themselves in this paper, so they started their own. And in this newspaper, they told national news, they told local news, and they really got out the word that black people exist in Omaha and are serving themselves because white people refuse to. So that first black newspaper set a precedent. It opened up the doors. Jim Bell was born in 1884. Jim Bell was an important cultural figure who emerged uh, in at the turn of the century and really took a lot of uh, hold across the African-American community, not as some great political leader, not as some great social leader, but as a businessman who was determined to make his buck doing his work. And he showed the economic viability of the African-American community in Omaha in a way that nobody had before him. The first black labor union was formed in Omaha in 1887. This shows an important trend that continued to happen in the years after, in the decades after, but it began in 1887. In 1890, the tide changed again with white supremacy wanting to get its hold back. Lots of negative things began to really unfold overtly in the city. That doesn't mean that they didn't happen before now, it's just that they were recorded. But there was some positivity that was mixed in as well. In the 1890s, a national building loan program was started by black people for black people in Omaha in 1890. So that's a powerful tool of economic resilience and economic self-sustainability reflecting that commitment to black excellence in 1890. Again, wrap your head around 130 years ago in Omaha, black excellence was at work. That's hard for a lot of white people to imagine. And again, goes against that popular narrative that a lot of us were taught and brainwashed with frankly, when we were in school. George Smith was a laborer. He was a worker. And in the, 18, in the late 1880s, he was accused of raping a white girl down at Cortland Beach in what we think of as Carter Lake today. He was not convicted of that. However, he was implicated in another rape in 1891. They brought George Smith from his home to the Douglas County Courthouse, the second Douglas County Courthouse. And they put him in a cell there in 1891. This isn't the story that you've already heard. You probably don't know this history because this was 30 years before, 20 years before the next lynching. In 1891, they took, they, a mob of 10,000 white Omahans, took George Smith from his cell in downtown Omaha in the courthouse, and they lynched him in downtown Omaha in 1891. In 1898, there was the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. You can read the whole story of George Smith on my website on NorthOmahAhistory.com, and again, more information is inside my book. In 1898, Omaha had gone through a decade of hard economic times. The whole nation was suffering during the 90s, and they wanted to bounce back. They wanted to show that Omaha was a vibrant place to do good business. And so they held an exposition that was basically a world's fair. You might have heard or seen this, basically these images of tall, glistening white buildings. They looked like Greek and Roman temples. They were circled around Kuntz Park. Uh, and what we think of as the Kuntz Place neighborhood today up at uh, Florence Boulevard and about Pinckney Street. And there were more than 100 buildings across this entire area built just for this exposition. It was a spectacular time. They, they called it the White City because of the gleaming white building, surely. The, the organizers of the event had gone to leaders in Omaha's Black community and said, hey, do you guys want to roll in this? And after some discussion among African-Americans, uh, it was largely decided as a whole that no, Blacks didn't want to be pigeonholed into one image for all white people to think that they understood Black people. They understood in the 1890s, the multiplicity and diversity 
among the African-American population. By this point, you had black people who were organizing for the Democratic Party while the Democratic Party was still overtly racist. By this point, you had the Democrats were conservative and the Republicans were liberal. So to have that political diversity within the black community is hard for a lot of white people to grok. But also this imagery of having a monolithic black culture, blacks were already fighting against very actively. So no, they didn't want a representation inside of the expo. So what did the expo organizers do? Who, by the way, were all white, of course, and rich white men. And they went and contracted with a guy from Arkansas who put in what he called the old plantation exhibition. And what did that exhibition do? Ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking at the screen, you'll see a photo of the old plantation exhibition in Omaha during the 1898 Trans-Mississippi and International Expo. That's right, it was built simply to reinforce every white stereotype of every African-American person in the United States at the time. They literally, by their own account, uh, they literally brought old cabins from the South and claimed that slaves had lived there in those cabins, and they rebuilt them right there on the site as part of the Trans-Mississippi Expo. So when you hear people wave the flag and talk about how great that expo was, let's remember that that expo was great for a few people. And they generally, again, they looked like me, white males who were moderately successful, if not more so. There were African-Americans who came and attended. They were allowed to come in, but it was such a limited attendance and it was such a limited welcoming that there was actually a specific day designated for African-Americans to come from around the region to participate in the expo. Out of six months of programs, there was one day for African-Americans. Segregation was normalized in Omaha during the 1890s. Neighborhoods were segregated where African-Americans were not allowed to live out of certain physical boundaries within the city. Schools were segregated where African-Americans were known to attend these certain schools and never allowed to be in any other school. Hotels, restaurants, bars, all of these things were segregated during this time. You can read about that more inside of my book, really specific examples. At the turn of the century into the 20th century, segregation became entrenched in Omaha. The near north side emerged as the African American community in the first decade of the century. The first ads for black only housing came around in Omaha around 18, or I'm sorry, 1903. And these ads really confirmed for us black people were only allowed to live where white people wanted them to. And generally speaking, that was north of Dodge, and even by that point, north of Cumming and east of 24th Street, later east of 30th. We're going to talk about how that happened really formally and was enforced by the U.S. Army. But uh, for the sake of illustration, you understand that it began to emerge. 24th and Lake became the center of the Black community. It still wasn't predominantly Black by that point, but it became the center. 24th Street was very diverse and very vibrant during this era. From Dodge Street all the way up to Lake, was literally packed with two and three and four story buildings going all the way from Dodge, all the way to Cumming, all the way to Lake. You drive from Cumming to Lake Street today on 24th Street and you will not see barely any evidence of what it was. If you see one two story building along the way and there's a 10, know that at one time there was more than a hundred. Oh, by the way, black people didn't burn those down on their own but that's a different story. Black owned businesses proliferated during this era. We heard them began to get established in the 1860s. By this point, we had black owned bars. We had black owned hotels. Like I mentioned, we also had black doctors. We also had black lawyers. We had lots of African-American businesses emerge. When you hear people say that there was no uh, successful black businesses, the 50 years of multiple businesses histories that started in the 19, in the first decade of the 19th, 20th century would prove you otherwise. The Black Elks was established in 1905. You can still find them today at 25th and Lake in a beautiful Columbia Hall that was built uh, in the 1920s that they ended up operating. But long story short, they were started in 1905. I mentioned that specifically because a lot of Black social clubs and Black, um, specifically Black fraternities and sororities were established in the first decade of the 20th century. 
Finally, the Omaha Fire Department hired black firefighters in 1906. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, but Adam, you didn't mention the first black legislature. Okay, Matthew Ricketts, Dr. Matthew Ricketts became the first black legislator in Nebraska in 1892. I didn't mention that because a lot of people already know it. But what you might not know is that there's been more than a dozen African-American legislators after him, including the longest ever serving black or the longest ever serving legislator in Nebraska history, Ernie Chambers. He's among the legacy of black legislators from North Omaha. Uh, let me let me go ahead and just answer you right now, Ken. No. <laughs> so um uh, Ken asked if that's Pete Ricketts' cousin. The answer is no. We don't know any family connection yet, but that would be an awesome thing to, to uh, ferret out. 1910, this phenomenal thing happens across the United States that did not pass Omaha. Instead, it's soaked into the city and particularly into the African-American community. It's called today by academics, it's called the New Negro Arts and Letters Movement. You might know it more informally or colloquially as... The uh, it's the same movement that brought us the work of W.B. Du Bois. It's the same movement that brought us the writing of uh, Hurston and, and other powerful authors from the area. It's the same movement that we associate with Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance. The new Negro arts and letters movement was footed in poetry, was footed in philosophy, was footed in history, was footed in so many different things. This man who's shown on this slide right here, George Wells Parker, was one of the main figures from the New Negro Arts and Letters movement in Omaha during that era. George Wells Parker was the author of the first published Afrocentric history in the world called The Children of the Sun. In this book, Parker contended that Africans had birthed all culture from the continent and that white people from Greece and Italy stole that culture to establish the dominance of Rome and Greece. Parker was ahead of his time is not the right phrase. He was a spectacular thinker, a powerful orator. He loved speaking and just did a, a lot of things in his life. You can read his biography on my site. But the long story short is he was emblematic of all of the movement in Omaha at that time. You see from the rest of this slide that a lot of other things were happening in that decade. You can read the rest in my book, Omaha Black History. I'm gonna repost the link to a donation uh, for a donation to the Omaha Black History. It's called the Great Plains Black History Museum. Um, I don't collect money from my work, that's not the point. I'm here today to share this with you. So to help do that a little bit, I'm going to flip up through the chat and I'm going to go through questions and uh, we'll kind of read through those. Um, Cameron, do you want to read questions to me so that I don't have to continue to flip through this chat like this? Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. I'd uh, be happy to do that. Let's see. Um, Just so everybody knows, I'm going to repost that link right now to the Great Plains Black History Museum. You can make a donation there. Yeah, uh, I'll start with with a question uh, Stephanie Kinsey posts, and this may be a little bit rhetoric uh, <laughs> of a rhetorical question, Stephanie, but she asked as you were walking through um, some of the earlier history, what can we do to get this in our history books? So maybe do you have any advice on what action we can take to maybe pressure? Um, uh, yeah, so so I took it upon myself. I, I just published this book uh, last month and I'm super excited for it, obviously. But um, I took it upon myself to order 100 copies for myself, and I sent them to folks who I thought needed them across Omaha, including the, um, the superintendent of Omaha Public Schools, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion director for Omaha Public Schools, who used to be the history director, and the current history director for Omaha Public Schools. However, the Omaha School Board, each member of that board needs a copy the West Side School Board, the West Side Curriculum Director, the West Side History Director for the district need copies of this book specifically, if only to say it exists. And I don't need people to use this book. I don't need it to be highly regarded. That's not my point. My point is I want people to understand this is just 250 pages. There are, oh wait, what is this? 
Guys, I've written three books of Omaha history before this point, North Omaha history specifically. These aren't about African-Americans only that combines the entire community's history. 900 pages. I didn't focus on African-Americans, so I wrote another one just about African-American history. I think I could write three more of these, and I'm still not getting the whole story. So we need more people to learn, especially within the education system. This history exists, more work needs to be done on it. We've got to teach it. And we can go by going through the education system to influence the education system, both at the district level, at the local building level. So if you have a student in high school right now, in middle school, give copies of this book to their teachers so they know it exists. This is how we infiltrate. Finally, we need to get to the Nebraska State Department of Education where the history director for the state is an African-American woman and a social studies director, I'm sorry. Uh, and she's an African-American woman who strongly believes in this history and loves this book. So hopefully we're gonna create some change there, but it would help if the legislature got copies. It would help if the people who uphold white supremacy in history really began to understand it's not all about us. That's my response. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, another question came from uh, Taylor. So. He asked, uh, do we know what the integration of Omaha schools looked like? For example, the integration of Boston school system in the 1970s was conducted through busing. So the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. Uh, if you look on NorthOmahaHistory.com, I was just flipping through the slides to see if I had that image in there still. I don't. But if you look, you can just Google um, the segregated schools in Omaha history and my article will come up. It's the only article about segregation in Omaha public schools. You can read that for basic uh, information that you're looking for. And it's also soaked throughout my book. I don't know if I've mentioned it, Omaha Black History. Fantastic. Thank so you. as far as in the chat, I believe those are the only two questions I can, can see. Ken, who's saying, keep me honest here if I missed anything. Yeah, that's the only thing I see, Cam. Well, we've got a new one. Uh, Rod Hernandez posted a question in the chat. Um, one of the biggest challenges in writing history is obtaining and evaluating your sources. What are some challenges that you've encountered with your research? Um, that's a great question, Rod. And, and process questions are, are kind of my favorite, especially when you're a history nerd. So for me, one of the greatest I mean, the, the most important thing was actually finding sources uh, and locating original sources. So in history, there are multiple levels of sources. You have your primary source your, that comes from the mouth of the people who live the experience. You have your secondary sources that interpret that first level. And then you have your tertiary and other sources. And that's really what I'm writing here is a tertiary source that um, holds, you know, it, it, it summarizes a whole lot of different sources. In the back of my book, uh, I put the first ever um, bibliography of Black history in Omaha that tried to be comprehensive. There's about 100 entries in it where I share all my different sources. Um, but basically, I tried to get to those primary sources as often as I could, Rod, and then accept that the, 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 the authenticity and richness of those sources was appropriate and right because it came from African Americans. As a white author writing into black history it's not my job to interpret the sources especially and especially when they're african-american my job isn't to validate black people my job is simply to hear their words and i take it upon myself to repeat them so i summarize the facts in this book without doing a lot of analysis without doing a lot of take apart especially when it came to the african-american authors who wrote before me um, instead i'm simply repeating a lot uh, I think that uh, the other part of the challenges with the research is that the sources, again, aren't brought into one place. The Great Plains African American History, or the Great Plains Black History Museum is a spectacular source for a lot of information, but even their collection is limited in the amount that they can show at any given time, and getting access to that collection is challenging. So we need people who are in the city to go to the museum, to support the museum, to stand up for the museum, and to help them get that information out more. And that's one of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest things that we can do to support this history getting further out as well. Hey, Adam, we're almost at time, but I wanted to throw one more question out there. And, and I remember when we had our initial uh, session with you and you were kind enough to meet with us and you were giving us some of this information, I recall after we got done talking, one of the things that just completely blew my mind was, and I had never given this any thought, you said there is a, uh, the city of Lincoln has a deep black history background. And I was like, what? 
because it's like 10 people in my mind, it's only 10 black people in Lincoln, in my mind. So to be able to hear that, I was just blown away. So we only have a couple of more minutes, but if you could just touch on that real quick, that would be great. Yeah, for real. Um, I moved down to Lincoln in 95, back in 1995. And uh, uh, I had a chance, I was an AmeriCorps member. AmeriCorps is a domestic Peace Corps that was that's run by the federal government. And I had a chance to uh, work at the Clyde Malone uh, Black Community Center, it was called back in the 90s. And the Clyde Malone Center is named for an African-American activist from the 1920s through the 1970s who was a powerhouse in black politics in Lincoln. That's right. There were enough African-Americans in Lincoln in, from 1920s through the 1970s to have a powerhouse figure among them. Uh, so start, starting at the Malone Center and working your way out, you can find a whole bunch of black history. Also, some of the most beautiful photographs from the 1870s, 80s, and 90s of all of Nebraska were taken by an African-American photographer based out of Lincoln, working in predominantly in Lincoln. And those photos are actually on the internet today and you can go and peek, peep at them right now. But the long story short is that black people started moving to Lincoln out of a hope of building political clout in the state capital after Omaha lost that capital. That's right, Omaha was the territory capital from 1854 to 1867. And black people thought that when the capital moved, they needed to move with it. So they left Omaha, they went to Lincoln, they established African-American churches, African-American businesses, a black neighborhood that's still segregated today, by the way. And uh, yeah, uh, Lincoln has its own history. Now, a fascinating thing to go with that, Ken, is that across the state of Nebraska, there are records of at least 10 different majority black communities statewide between the 1870s and the 1930s. Hmm, what happened in the 1920s that drove Black people out of rural Nebraska? Oh, the emergence of the KKK. I didn't even begin to touch base on the KKK in Omaha in the 1920s, but let's just wrap it up this way. Malcolm X was born in Omaha in 1926. His parents were active organizers for the United Negro Improvement Association that was started by Marcus Garvey. His parents were firebombed and sent out of Omaha by the KKK. Malcolm X ended up growing up in Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. These same white supremacist groups scared blacks out of rural Nebraska into Omaha and changed the entire dynamic of the state. Lincoln had its own issues, but all of this history is waiting to be written and emerged. So right now there's NorthOmahaHistory.com. Maybe we need Lincoln's black history. Maybe we need more than just what I've done because I'm a meager white guy who's just trying as hard as he can. Adam. Kudos to you. I mean, just again, we knew this was going to be a lot of information and just it was it was worth every minute of us listening to you. And you still have just so much stuff that you could give us. Um, <laughs> is it I, I'm going to probably put you on the spot when I ask you this, but is it possible that we can get you back at some point? Absolutely. And the more that people donate to the Great Plains Black History Museum, I put the link right there in the chat again, the more it's going to motivate me to do that. I would love to come back anytime, Ken. You got me. Awesome. So guys, let's go ahead and give our guest speaker a round of applause or some finger snaps or something. We sincerely appreciate Adam taking the time. And again, keep in mind, he didn't charge us a dime for his time and he's on the West Coast. So it's still rather early there, but he was more than willing to, to come in and to depart this information to us. So let's hit that link. If you get an opportunity, every dollar amount counts. So don't think any amount is just too small. Every dollar amount counts. If you have <clears> any <throat> questions after the fact, let's go ahead and send them to uh, any one of your big chairs, Hussein, Cameron, or even myself. And we'll, we'll, we will work with Adam to get that answered. Adam's direct link is also been put into chat. So feel free to reach out to him as well. If you're so motivated, go out there and get that book. And again, he has other books as well, but go out there and support him and his endeavors. Again, support his labor of love. Adam, once again, we wanna thank you um, for helping Big 402, our group, and we all feel a little smarter and a little bit more knowledge as we prepare to go back to our LinkedIn duty. So thank you very much. And thank everyone for coming out with us today and participating here in our, our Zoom meeting. Have an awesome rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.